Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Leadership in Politics with Dr. Abraham. On the show today, I have a special guest for you. Keynote speaker and author, Ken Pasternak. Ken, welcome to the show. Welcome to Leadership in Politics. Thank you, Abe. Glad to be here. It's wonderful to have you. Tell me a little bit about yourself. For those audience that they're not familiar with you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm speaking to you from Helsinki, Finland, which is my major home these days. But I was originally born in the States, in the East Coast. I grew up, went to Yale, got a degree in engineering, uh, studied in France for a year, but ran out of money. So I came back to the States and ended up in corporate banking uh, for mm -hmm. six years in New York. And that bank, uh, Citibank by name, sent me then to London, to Finland, to Istanbul, to Brussels. And along the way, I met my wife, my Finnish wife, when I was stationed here for four years. Um, I left Citibank and joined another bank called the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development in 91, which was charged with assisting the transition of uh, formerly communist countries into market economies. And I ran an education and training department, building banking schools and business schools in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Very uh, privileged to travel the world, uh, do a lot of consulting for organizations from Asia, Africa, Middle East. Uh, Europe and uh, North America in particular. I've written a couple of books, uh, a book called Managing Your Strengths about the life orientation system of helping people to develop uh, better interpersonal relationships. Performance at the Limit, Business Lessons, Formula One Motor Racing. Okay. Tell me a little bit about this book. Welcome and tell me a little bit. It's Performance at the Limit. What is Performance at the Limit? What's the premise of this book? In the United States, people may not be as familiar as people around the world, but Formula One racing is the most watched annual sporting event on television. Over 400 million people watch this sport uh, on an annual basis, which brings in huge amount of money, huge amount of interest. It's about 10 teams. Each team has two cars, and they race in a typical not a corona year in 22 countries, mm -hmm. 22 races on five different continents between March and November for the championship for the team and the championship for the driver. Mm -hmm. uh, these teams are very large. Well, some are 125 people, some are five, six, seven, 800 people. And their budgets range from $200 million to five, $600 million. So they're not small enterprises, they're major businesses themselves. It's so that's the Formula One. This, this is your introducing us to Formula One. Correct. Well, how does Formula about, One and performance at the limit work together? Why? Yeah, I, I, was, that's, I was engaged by a law firm, a major law firm based in London, to help develop a workshop to train their lawyers in business acumen. And they said, let's take this fantastic sport or business of Formula One and see what we can do with that. Mm -hmm. So we created a two-day workshop where I role-played, I was the vice president of strategy for Volkswagen, trying to figure out how to enter Formula One under the Audi brand. All the other major manufacturers were there, mm -hmm. Toyota and Ford and Jaguar and everyone else. So uh, the lawyers for two days became business consultants. Mm -hmm. And it was a very successful program. We ran it 50 times over three years. And the two other people I did the program with, one a former commercial director for two of the Formula One teams and a professor of strategy, decided there's a lot of learnings here. This was an effective business an analogy that had a nice hook. I remember seeing these race and then the way they changed the tire, it's less than millisecond, so precise. And the speed is amazing. The team dynamic and the way they work together is amazing. It's so, one of the more interesting elements and 18 people are on the car when the car pulls into the pit. And the typical time for a team to change all four tires and get the car off running again is around two to 2.5 seconds. That's amazing. It, it's a blur. But what goes into those two and 2.5 seconds is what's really interesting about teamwork clear roles and responsibility, clear leadership, practice, all the things that one would expect from great athletes and great performers of any kind. 
in performing at the limit. Performing at the limit, yes. And probably exceeding the limit to the betterment of the driver and the race and, and the viewership because they're creating a magic while they're doing what they're doing. I remember I used to be younger when I used to watch these shows. Kind of resonate when, when you start talking about it. I said, I, yeah, I know what he's talking about. And I'm sure most people have seen it probably in the US, not as much unless you're a fan of the sport, but in Europe and that mm -hmm. part of the world, Middle East and all these places, probably Africa as well. That is a sport to watch. It, you know, for one point of view, it's cars going around a track. And in Formula One, it's not like NASCAR. They're not going around in a circle. And windy tracks that bend and, and move. So that makes it interesting. But quite honestly, what really got me excited was when I looked behind the scenes mm -hmm. at how these teams perform to such great uh, success. Uh, you know, what goes in from a leadership point of view, from a teamwork point of view, from an innovation point of view? That's really what got me excited, given my disciplines. Give me the three dynamics activities. Tell me about those. What, what are they? Well, like any organization that wants to succeed in a technological industry, they need to innovate. And teams are constantly innovating. In fact, you know, a Formula One car is about 20 to 30,000 parts. And during the season, the car that finishes the season mm -hmm. is about 90% changed from the car that started the season, meaning they're changing parts constantly as they try to get greater speed based on their learning from experience. Uh, as they go through the season, trying new experiments uh, on the car, from, a, from an aerodynamic point of view, from brakes point of view, from gears point of view. And of course, during races, it could rain. They race in the rain. So strategies change. How often do you come in and change tires is all about understanding how to change and transform your business. Do you adjust with whatever the environment is? You might say it's a very agile, agile. business. The organizations have to be extremely agile in order to succeed. Mm -hmm. But the third element is what we call integrating, responsible for the chapter on leadership. And I was so immersed in all the leadership journals and all the leadership books. And I was quite tired of the word leadership. It mm. seemed so banal and so commonplace. And we were talking to the leaders of one of the teams and we said, what do you do? How do you lead? And he brought up an old notion, if you might remember from, I think, Hewlett Packard days, of management by walking around. Mm. He said, I have a very unique position. At the top of the organization, I have a helicopter view of what's going on. I'm the only person who has that. So, and I cannot know everything. The world is advanced so that a leader cannot be knowledgeable about every single aspect of the business. Mm -hmm. But what I can do is look around the whole organization and integrate all the different functions and activities in order to meet our vision and our goal. And that's where the word integration came from rather than leadership, that the key leaders of these teams are integrators. They're so breaking down the silos. They're interdependent on each other. Very much so. Mm. You, you know, you can build the strongest engine, but if it doesn't work well with the chassis and the aerodynamics and the braking and the gears and all the other functions that are in these Formula One cars, extremely highly technical um, hybrid engines, by the way, mm. they're not just petrol engines. They're, they're the most fuel efficient engines that exist on earth right now. Um, everything has to work together or else the car is not successful. If we can pick up anything or any point of what you have said and everything you've said is important is integration. It's making the whole. Making, making the whole through the integration process. The heads of Ferrari when they were the most successful team at the time said, you know, it's not an aero design. It's not a tire, it's not an engine, it's a Ferrari. It's the mm. whole package. And the whole package has to work in order to succeed. And the same is true for all organizations. You know, sales needs products, products need manufacturing, manufacturing needs sourcing. Uh, 
We need HR to bring the talent in. We need operation and controls to make sure that we're operating to the, you know, to the extent, uh, flawless extent as possible. Any one of those departments that's doing well is great, but they all have to do well and they all have to work across the functional divide successfully for the organization to succeed. Well, the concept is true. The concept is true and accurate as far as you have to work together in harmony for the success and for an effective team and performance, which is a given thing. With Formula One is a different story. You really have to exceed the limits because if you are late for one second, that's it, you lose the game. You're not gonna be on top of, the, of your performance. Whatever you've done is fine, you succeeded, but you lost your, your objective. You're absolutely right, Abe. And another way to look at it is you're, if you're not moving forward, if you're not getting faster each weekend, you're going backwards. You're going back because your competitors Advanced. are not sitting back. They're not no, standing no. still. So what the lesson we learn here, if you stagnate in your business at any level, you're going to lag behind and you're not moving forward. Transformation, integration, innovation, pulling it all together. I agree. And I, I love it. I love that. So, is there anything else we need to talk about in the three dynamic activities or we cover them all? We cover them all, but I, it's a good way also to raise one other point, uh, and that is about focus. Okay. Because the, the question is, why are you doing all of these things? You might call it vision. You might call it focus. But you have to really know what you're trying to achieve in order to pull it together and move it in the right direction. Now, Formula One does make it a bit easier in that you're trying to achieve getting the car to operate faster every single week. But there's a great story about a guy named uh, Frank Williams who uh, ran up until recently one of the major teams. Mm -hmm. And he told us that uh, whenever anyone came to him and asked him for money, more than 5,000 pounds, he only asked them one question. And that question was, if I give you this money, will it make the car go faster? Mm -hmm. That's the objective. That's the objective of the whole game. Exactly. And mm -hmm. I asked executives sometimes, if someone comes to you and wants some budget for a project, what question do you ask? And is that in alignment with the company's overall vision and goals? Very, very effective way to think. I like it. It's a winning formula because if you meet the objective, the resources are there for you doesn't matter what the budget is, we're going to support you as long as you make us win because the speed matters in Formula One. The mm -hmm. speed matters, right? Efficiency, yeah. team dynamic, teamwork together has to lead to, of course, an enjoyable sport, but that's not the main aim. The main aim is how to win the game and you win the game by being faster than everyone else with, with safety, of course. Precisely. So you didn't write the book by yourself. You wrote it with co-authors, two, two of yeah. them? Or, okay, tell me about these uh, co-authors. Who are they and why, why you chose them? Well, the two people were Professor Mark Jenkins from Cranfield University and Richard West, uh, who had been a commercial director at two of the teams, McLaren and um, Williams. Uh, they, we were actually packaged by this law firm Okay. to build that uh, workshop that I mentioned earlier on. So we were uh, brought together and we clicked because we were bringing different dimensions to the partnership mm -hmm. in creating the workshop and then writing the book. Uh, Richard had the hands-on experience being in the pit lane, in the garage, in the office with teams, traveling around the world on the circuit. Mm -hmm. Mark had the academic background of having written case studies and understood Formula One from an academic point of view. Mm -hmm. And my background as a banker, as a consultant, as a project manager, uh, brought a more, say, pragmatic or commercial point of view. Approach to it. Approach. So you, you complemented each other. So it was an excellent team. It was a great team. And, you know, we mm -hmm. wrote the first book in 2005. 
It was translated into Japanese. Mm -hmm. Then we wrote a, a second edition in 2009, uh, published by Cambridge University Press, all the three editions. By the way, in 2007, we also made an eight part TV series with the BBC called Formula Success. And then That's in wonderful. 2016, we uh, rewrote the book and came out with a third edition. And just last year in 2019, the book was translated and published in uh, Mandarin Chinese and in Turkish. Nice. So we've had a great run with this and great- Why these markets? It. Why these markets? Why the Chinese? Why the Turkish? Well, Why not French? Why not other languages? Or the intentions to go everywhere? I only wish, actually. You know, we've mm -hmm. urged our publishers to try to push in Germany and France and Spain. Mm -hmm. um, Japan have been great big Formula One fans, and there's a great race in Japan, except for this year because of COVID-19. And China also embraced Formula One. Um, and there's been a race in Shanghai now for about eight years, and it's going to continue. So. We know that the authorities in Formula One want to have a second race in China. So they've embraced this and, and it resonates as a story for them as well. Germany should be the one because I thought, if my understanding is correct, most of the winners in these Formula One were of German descent or German? Well, there are or... a couple of connections to Germany which are important. Firstly, a Mercedes, mm. uh, the Daimler Benz company. They're the champions for the last six years and will probably be champions again this year. Uh, they have one of the greatest drivers that came out of Germany was Michael Schumacher. Schumacher, and, yes. Mm -hmm. And also Sebastian Vettel, who won the championship four times. There have been races at two or three different locations in Germany every year. So yes, there is a very strong link to Germany. To Germany, yeah. Um, if someone out there is listening who uh, wants to publish his book in German or French or Spanish, please uh, contact me. I'd love to. And we're going to also put his contact information, so you better do it if you know how to. Yeah. Well, of course, without any doubt, hopefully this show will bring more lights to it. So tell me, let's go further. Tell me about the no blame philosophy. What is it? What's the purpose for it? What's the role of leaders? How does it work? Well, you know, in any organization that strives on innovation and creativity, you need to create a culture and an environment where people are willing to take risk. And if, of course, there's gonna be finger pointing if something goes wrong, as soon as something happens, there is a fault. Mm -hmm. You're not going to create the environment where people will wanna put their head above the parapet and take risks. Uh, we had a great example about a pit stop that we talked about earlier. It happened some years ago in Portugal. The driver, Nigel Mansell, was winning the race. He came in for a pit stop. He drove away and his back right rear tire fell off. Mm. And we spoke to the person who headed up that pit stop team. And we said, what did you do? And he must've been really angry. He said, well, he was angry as the driver, should be perhaps, but as the leader of the team, I decided that it wasn't worth it to point a finger, finger at the person who was working the wheel gun on that tire. We wanted to isolate the problem, not the person. And that's one of those phrases that resonates with a lot of my clients. Mm -hmm. When things go wrong, we want to isolate the problem, not, the, not the person. Not the responsible party. So this way you take a full responsibility as an organization or as a team, instead of assigning blames toward the person who... Now, is there like a punishment? Did they ever punish that individual? different training, uh, sag well, them out. Training may be part of it because mm -hmm. as you begin to isolate the problem, it could have been a material failure, could have been equipment failure, it could have been not enough training for the person. Mm -hmm. So you would look into that. But no, I wouldn't say there's a punishment. However, don't make the same mistake twice. That is worthy of some form of punishment. So or, this is or, where the lesson learned is Make yeah. sure the mistake is not continuing. Yeah. So that's the, the philosophy all about, which is excellent thing. But is that is there anything further you want to? Well, it's that? just it, it it just jives with the very strong notion that we read about a lot these days of psychological safety. Psychological safety. Tell me a little bit about psychological safety. How does well, it apply here? Well, it applies in terms of the leadership of the organization creating a culture where employees are not afraid to take risk. 
They're not afraid to speak up. They're not afraid to, to talk back politely and constructively in order to assist the team in achieving its goals. Tell me what happens if this environment exists. Oh, creativity and innovation flourish. Mm -hmm. And learning happens. Learning from mistakes. Learning that that didn't work, let's try it a different way. And rapidly moving on to moving to the next experiment and the next opportunity, the next innovation. So this we call the learning moments. There are a lot of learning moments. And, and if you may, I, it would lead me to talk about another important element of Formula One. They have what you might call an obsession with reviews. Uh, and by this, I mean, most companies follow a cycle of planning, doing, and some reviewing. Mm -hmm. You become very good at planning and budgeting and strategizing, maybe even too much sometimes. Doing is all about executing. And we do that to the extent that we have the talent and the capabilities to do that. Mm -hmm. But from my experience, reviewing doesn't take place all that much. You know, I've worked in banks, I've consulted to banks, they do reviews, but they're usually well after the fact. And even when they review and learn from what might have gone wrong or what could have done, done better, mm -hmm. are those learnings incorporated into the way they operate? Not often. So when we talk about reviewing, are we, review, are we receiving a reviewing from the public or self-assessment within so this way we can improve. We see what, we, what went wrong or where we can, where we can improve. Well, in, in the Formula One world, they do a lot of self-assessment. Okay. You know, on a racing weekend, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, there are two practice sessions on sat Friday, one on Saturday, and one on Sunday morning. After each practice session, they sit down with the drivers and key people. It may be 20, 30, 40 people who are in on the call. Mm -hmm. Some may be at the racetrack, in the garage, some may be at the factory, and they're all there to review what happened. It's a very stylized, very strict order of how they do that. They take away what they learned, what they want to change, mm -hmm. and move forward. When they do the rehearsal, they, the rehearsal, is it done on the racetrack itself or a oh, different yeah. location? No, no, they, they're racing on the track. They're trying out new pieces of equipment, new approaches, and they're taking the learnings from those experiments mm. and seeing what's going to stay on the car, what's going to be taken off, what's going to be added, what's subtracted. But you mentioned, you know, the, the customer or the, the outside reviewer. You know, if you take this concept of obsession with reviews, it very much fits into the agile working model mm. of continually innovating and going to your customer and asking and talking about it. But for the people who run Formula One, a company mm -hmm. called Libya, Liberty Media, they are taking concepts to the market and asking for input about the television production, about some of the rules and regulations, trying to get input from the fans mm -hmm. so that they engage the fans in the potential process of change for the overall sport and business. That's very nice, very nice. Yeah. Thank you for introducing us to the world of Formula One through your eyes and through your book, The Performance at the Limit. What else should we know? What else do you want to share with us on Formula One? Well, this year is a strange year because of COVID, but I can tell you they've re now raced, I think, eight or nine times in Spain, the UK, in Belgium, in Austria. And because of the bubble they've created very successfully, there has not been any cases of COVID reported. Amazing. It's mm -hmm. an amazing accomplishment so far. This weekend, they're racing in Sochi in Russia, and uh, they've been there a couple of years now. And uh, so far, so good. They're still clean, if you will, in terms of not having uh, the virus infect the, the, um, the, the sport. So I urge people to perhaps tune in. It, it's carried uh, in the United States, if you're watching from the United States, mm -hmm. uh, on ESPN, I think nowadays. And yes. maybe think about these other things that I've been talking about that go into what's the teams and their activities, not just watching the cars going around in circle. And of course, if, you, if you're interested mm -hmm. in purchasing the book from Amazon, uh, you know, 
that'll give you greater insights into what's happening uh, behind the scenes. Where can people find your book? Amazon for sure. Uh, the, the publisher, Cambridge University Press, is another place that will provide the book. But Amazon is probably the best source uh, for the book, quite frankly. So people will say, okay, we just listened to your interview, has a lot of insights. Why would we even bother buy the book? What would you say? Well, of course, we go into much more depths and anecdotes. Uh, we wrote the book based on interviews. And over the mm -hmm. years that we wrote the three editions, we did 100 interviews of leaders, technical directors, drivers, mechanics, authorities in the sport, all to give a flavor. So we're not just giving you point, point, point. We're giving you anecdotes mm -hmm. behind the scenes and deriving the learnings and the lessons from those anecdotes. Mm -hmm. And it's available now in Chinese, it's available in Turkish. I think it's still available in Japanese. In Japanese as well. Thank you for sharing that with us. My it was pleasure. A, it was a pleasure to have you. I thank you for your time. Dave, it's been a pleasure talking with you and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Of course. Thank you.